Here's a little tidbit from Darkness. Now, this is a futuristic fantasy novella. And uh, the basic premise is that there are two groups of psychics that have been separated and put into ships in space. And one of them is on a gothic cathedral that looks like Notre Dame in space, because why not? Because we're fantasy authors, we can do those things. And the other one is the light nest, which is essentially like a big round ball in space. So they're very different places. And uh, my heroine is on one nest, the light nest, and the hero's on the dark nest. And Ariadne has just been told, our heroine has just been told that Kristoff has just been killed aboard the dark nest. She thinks that there's something to that and wonders if that's really the truth. It's not because it wouldn't be a romance novel otherwise, hello. But anyway, so I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying that. Um, and so this is her processing his, uh, the news of his death in flashbacks. She was transported to the very first day she saw him. Across the reflecting pool at the registrar's office, sheltered by a solarium that kept out the searing heat of the home world's ever-rising temperatures, the sky beyond was a gemstone quality blue. Thirteen years old and unsure of everything, particularly why her parents had brought her down to this strange, temple-looking building for testing, she was told to go into the courtyard while her parents awaited in some sterile room for results. She'd always been scared something was wrong with her mind. Maybe something was. And then he walked out from the opposite wing, and she forgot everything. An incredible young figure in dark robes ripped apart the monotony of the white alabaster pillars that marched along the courtyard's eaves. He strode into the sunlight, beating down on the water, and stopped just at the pool's edge. Sensing her, his head snapped up to pierce her with a cool, onyx gaze. Ink-black hair trailed past his shoulders. His smooth, olive skin bore features so sharp they would have appeared sinister if they weren't so breathtakingly put together. He wore a fitted tunic of charcoal gray, lines of black braid accenting his body's angles as they gathered at a wiry waist. His tunic opened at the sides, front and back, the flowing fabric nearly sweeping to the ground if it weren't for his hefty boots that seemed made for a man far more mature. His clothes weren't tight enough to determine if his muscles proved him more an athlete or a scholar. Her mouth went dry. Her cheeks burst into flame. All she knew was that she wanted to speak to him, but she had trouble opening her mouth. She didn't know where she was, or why, or what to say. He seemed to read her mind. You're here because you'll be a counsel, like me, the young man said softly, and yet his words carried across the reflecting water as if the surface were there for no other reason than to amplify him. Ariadne tried to open her mouth again. He continued. Evidently the confusion was written on her face, or again, he'd read her mind. You haven't heard of a council? You must have one in your family. It's passed on, the ability, you know. Ability? Ariadne squeaked. She felt like a fool. The young man lowered his gaze as if gloating over a secret. To feel, sense, intuit, and know, really know, before anyone tells you, we're an elevated species. His sharp features curved into a haughty expression Ariadne wasn't sure she liked. We're just on the edge of something incredible, something we can't yet conceive of, but it's coming, he murmured, leaning forward conspiratorially. And that's what they're afraid of. His expression flashed fierce pride. Who's afraid? You, by the look of it. I... Ariadne didn't think her already red cheeks could withstand it, but she felt her skin burning hotter. I just don't know what's going on or why I've been left out here. To talk to me, of course. Everything happens as it should. I'm Kristoff. I'm Ariadne. I like the name. Thank you. She had to look down into her lap, unable to bear the intensity of his dark eyes. They will put us onto ships, Kristoff stated nonchalantly. Ariadne started, panic welling up within her. She had no idea what was happening, and they were going to send her off on a ship? Not immediately, he assured, but sometime. T to do what? I mean, what am I? What are you? I still don't understand. You will. You'll learn more in school. Not a regular human school, our school. For councils. Empaths. The newest breed. So we're a different breed? Kristoff leveled that piercing gaze again, as if she ought to know better. She would, in later years, grow to both love and hate that look. What do you think, he intoned. Ever wonder why you knew just what was happening in a room of people without speaking a word? Ever wonder why you knew your father was sad even when he smiled, or why you knew just the right thing to say to calm someone? Ever wonder why, in silence, you might catch just a whisper of someone's private thoughts? Yes, Ariadne burst into tears. She'd never thought she would be speaking with someone about these things. She assumed she was alone in this, that it wasn't anything worth mentioning or special, it was just weird. But she'd always been scared her brain was different somehow and wrong. 
Kristoff made a face. It's nothing to cry over. It should be celebrated. Councils are high-class citizens. Then why have I never heard of them? Ariadne queried, wiping her face. Because you wouldn't want to be exploited, now would you? We try to keep quiet, he replied simply. Ariadne shook her head. Exploitation, whatever that meant, didn't sound appealing. <laughs> Welcome to the next class of humanoid, Ariadne. Congratulations, you've evolved. Just like me, and the men and women that will be our professors, professors at school. Her head spun. She wasn't sure she wanted to be a new class of person or go to a new school. She just wanted to be normal. But she also wanted Kristoff to like her. Something about that sentiment seemed to be reflected in a sudden smile. We'll be friends, he declared. I can already tell that you'll keep my secrets, and I'll keep yours, he added in a murmur. He scrutinized her more closely and began walking around the reflecting pool towards her. Your eyes are beautiful amethysts. He approached, and Ariadne's breath stilled in her throat. He was so handsome. A titillating sensation plummeted down her body, an electric charge surging through her as he sat down on the bench next to her. You and I will be paired in training, I'm sure. I can feel you, he said, gesturing to his mind. His hand left his head and traveled towards her as it magnetized. May I touch you? He asked quietly, wonder lighting his enigmatic face. Ariadne nodded, forgetting that a moment ago she'd been crying. His hand cupped her cheek, and his slender young fingers caressed her temple, brushing her eyebrow and dragging past her earlobe. Her body gasped, her mouth was silent. Christoph seemed to hear it nonetheless. He smiled, and his dark eyes danced with delight. His finger slid down her cheek and took in the curve of her chin, just brushing the corner of her lips. Impulsively, she turned her face slightly so that her lips pressed against his fingers. His eyes widened, and she thought she heard his body gasp, too. Nothing could have prepared her for this fascination. Nothing could have prepared her for this immediate, mutual obsession. At the age of 13, she'd never felt any sort of attraction or even understood the concept that something was happening inside of her. She was magnetized to him. And even looking back, she realized it was more than just the stirrings of sexuality. It was a knowledge that this young man would grow up to irrevocably change her life. Her memory faded into the reality of the cloak wrapped tightly around her neck, the exact sensation of his arms. She climbed onto her bed in the, dark, in the light nest and let the feeling of his embrace travel down her shoulders. Ariadne had to break herself away from reliving their passion. What had been too blissful was too painful to recall. She threw the cloak aside, and her body shuddered with dismay as she was wrenched back into loneliness. Her watering eyes flickered to a sealed cabinet across the room. An old, forbidden desire flared. So many items stowed in secret. She opened a cabinet by punching a coat on the wall. An antique glass bottle sat within, filled with an amber fluid. An image printed on a thin slate lay next to it. The only picture of her and Kristoff together. Arms wrapped around each other, a carefree, almost silly expression on their faces. Who were those people and where did they go? What had they become? She'd become a reserved, privately sullen woman on the light nest, and Kristoff had become dead on the dark nest. Gingerly, she lifted the bottle to her lips and drank. A powerful old liquor hit her throat like fire, expanding up her sinuses and down her sternum. There had to be great care taken when it came to liquor and councils. Didn't take much to upset their delicate, empathic balance. Liquor could be a particularly volatile substance for chief councils who were at the height of their powers. That was why it was only permissible on the leisure deck where relative levels were monitored. Staff were ready to calm the angry, the weepy, the hysterical, anything that was in excess. Anything that made them other than the gifted children of reason and control. But no one could call Mariadne's monsters. No one but her personal god could handle such force. In school, councils were taught to monitor any drug use of any kind with vigilance. Many had died lost to the clutches of forces unhinging inside of them. Ariadne both agreed with and resented the monitored lounge. The monitors were never obvious, they were objective and relatively kind, but human nature, psychically augmented or no, often had a destructive streak that would surface regardless. Sometimes the destruction wanted to indulge and forget. She didn't care if she was breaking protocol, she needed a private release. She didn't care if it brought on the dragons no one could truly understand, or if the person who could talk to her through the mystic haze of the liquid wasn't there, and would never be there again. All she had was a cloak that approximated his embrace for company, and that was far from enough. <laughs>